every generation believes that it lives at the pinnacle of humanity. In the 20th century, we invented aeroplanes. We traveled to the moon. In the 21st, we are exploring Mars. We can glimpse deeper into the universe than ever before, further back in time towards the Big Bang. We can examine the tiniest atom. Over centuries, we have discovered how to exploit our world, its materials, and each other for power, influence, and destruction. In their adulthood, our grandchildren will regard our period as quaint and old-fashioned. We view the Victorians in that same way. But do we, did they, believe themselves thus? If we look back beyond that, say 7,000 years, to imagine savage, uncaring brutes, lacking intelligence and sophistication, we would be wrong. Neolithic folk were humans, just like you and me, with hopes, ambitions, beliefs, as well as fears and sorrows. They tilled the earth, they tended flocks and herds, they discovered gold, copper and jewels, as well as building materials. Here in Malta, these communities erected buildings older than the pyramids of Egypt. Their thoughts persist for us to discover as clear as written books. We know little of daily life for any individual, but can be sure that they had leaders, orators, charismatic occultists that everyone looked to for advice. They lived a tranquil life, at peace with nature. We don't find any warlike weapons, they lived in harmony. The temples we see today consist of altar rooms, apses, grand gateways and oracle rooms. These were the community centers where villagers came to learn from each other, be inspired by leaders and see fair play within society. The builders upended huge rocks without modern tools to form massive walls proving that these buildings were important to everyone at the time. There does not appear to have been a worship of sky fairies or long dead ancestors. The layout and decoration suggests a reflection on the fecundity of nature, the cycle of birth, life and death, womb-like curves, circular structures and cyclical patterns all add up to their recognition of Mother Earth. The megalithic temple of Adjerim dates from the Gantia phase at around 3600 BC. The builders employed local limestone to construct the Trilithon entrance, huge boulder walls and curving interior rooms. The corbelled roofs were constructed from successive courses of reducing sized stones. This temple was constructed on a high crag facing the sea. Examining the scene from here, it is clear that the earth is not flat. The sun, moon and stars all track an ellipse in the sky. Throw a stone into the air and it traces a parabola. Since 2009, Adjerim and nearby Nidra have been protected by canopies. There are remains of earlier temples here. The outer walls are canted inwards to furnish a strong building. The main entrance extends to a central passage directing us to six large chambers. Two of the apses are separated from the central corridor by these slabs pierced by rectangular openings. These bore curtains to restrict access. The southwestern apse encloses a high altar on the left and two smaller ones on the right, with a smaller chamber beyond. The island of Filfla, 
five and a quarter kilometers away is framed in the distant portal. This replica altar, the original is displayed in the National Museum of Archaeology of the Letter, has a pierced decoration with a shallow bowl on top. From the outside we discover a small aperture in the wall to one of the northern apses. The hole is positioned such that light from the rising sun shines into the apse to illuminate an altar on the summer solstice. Where the enclosure curves around to the east, we discover a small external shrine. A triangular block within this deep niche supported a horizontal slab acting as the altar. The shrine may have served in public ceremonies. Being next to the solstice hole, it could have carried seasonal significance. The nearby temple complex of Nidra comprises three buildings erected during the Gantia and Tarsian phases from around the middle of the 4th millennium BC. The buildings are arranged in a semicircle, sharing a common forecourt formed by the natural rock surface. The builders employed hard, durable coralline limestone for the walls. The three apsed upper temple is the oldest, dating from 3600 BC. The middle temple dates from around 2600 BC. Its central doorway is a large hole cut in a piece of upright limestone. The lower temple from the early Tarsian phase at around 2900 BC contains an entrance passage covered by horizontal slabs. We can see remains of the corbelled roof in the main chamber. At the equinoxes, sunlight aligns along the corridor. At the solstices, the rising sunbeams pass at a slant between the sides of the doorway onto the edges of two megaliths within the first chamber. Inside, a drilled stone contains indicators of several lunar periodicities. In one of the larger rooms stands an elaborate porthole which directs us to a small room at the rear. This is framed by a trilithon, itself flanked by a pair of upright slabs. Could this have been an oracle room? Did seekers arrive here with the eternal questions of why, when and what? Many artefacts from here are now on display in the National Museum of Archaeology at Valletta. This sculpture of a pregnant woman bears nine lines scored on her back. Was this a counting method, coupling circuits of the moon to the expected birth date? The idea of birth and regeneration stood as strong then as for us today. It is not a large leap to suggest that the elders of this community were women. The Skorba Temple at Magar dates from 3600 BC. Although there are scant remains, it is clear that the two successive buildings add up to an established community. Indeed, archaeologists have discovered remains of ancient dwellings, some predating the temples. The layout is a three-apse cluster around a central hall accessed by the grand entrance. The structure above ground level has collapsed, but some reconstruction from the 1960s reveals something of what the Neolithic inhabitants witnessed. The settlement lasted here for 12 centuries before the construction of the temples. Carbon analysis places habitation from 4850 BC. Tagrat consists of two buildings, the larger being from the Gantia phase of around 3600 BC. 
the smaller from around 600 years later. Worshippers would approach the semicircular facade to enter through the monumental doorway. Inside, three circular rooms surround a paved rectangular court. Pottery discovered here dates activity from the Hard Lamb phase at 5000 BC until the later Tarsian phase at 2500 BC. This suggests that this temple came well after the establishment of habitation on this site. Was there an earlier, less substantial structure here that this building replaced? A local farmer discovered the stones in 1916. Excavations took place between 1923 and 1926. The roots of a large carob tree had disturbed the structure, but by 1937, archaeologists had reformed the displaced area. John D. Evans and David H. Trump carried out further excavations in the 1950s and 60s. The Tarsian temple complex comprises four connected buildings. The oldest is from 3600 BC, only visible from its floor plan. It contains five chambers. The other three structures date from between 3150 and 2500 BC. The South Temple is notable for its prehistoric art, including spirals, animals, and a large figure wearing a pleated skirt. The Central Temple encloses six chambers, a unique arrangement. A large slab with a double spiral motif forms a barrier to the four rear apses. This suggests that the areas beyond were reserved for favoured members of the community. Excavation has revealed that worshippers practice rituals involving animal sacrifice. We can see how the Neolithic builders move the megaliths. Researchers have discovered stone rollers outside the South Temple. cultures harboured fables to explain the development of agriculture. The ancient Egyptians worshipped Isis, the Greeks Demeter, and the Romans Ceres. Tending crops and herds encouraged settled communities over nomadic tribes. This resulted in strength and growth. The agriculture on which this Neolithic population thrived induced its need to depart for North Africa around 2350 BC, 3550 years after its arrival. Farmers had removed shade by chopping down the trees. The fields were losing their fertility. How did they know that there were lands to the south? Traces of similar buildings exist in Tunisia. Did these travellers develop into the Punic people of Carthage? This Neolithic population of Malta have left us messages of continuity and hope.
It's not time that separates us from this Neolithic society, it is the perception of our own importance. We have discovered selfishness, competition and exploitation. The Neolithic inhabitants of Malta supported cooperation, respect for nature and the earth, and a desire for a cohesive community. Watch some more from Radio Jonaphone. Subscribe to the channel. Enjoy.